Thank you, Karina, and thank you, Wonderlust, and the Wonderlust organizers, and Amanda Kasgar of Lululemon, who first brought me here last year to show me what a wonderful community this was and how much I would learn from being with all of you. And somehow I think she might be involved in having brought me back. And um, it's actually really great to be here. I'm a wonk, a nerd, a scholar, an art historian. Um, but I'm also a passionate believer, like I think you all are, in the transformative potential of yoga and of a certain a nexus and a potential that lies within creativity and artwork that brings out the best in ourselves, but also enables us to look back in time, look back in history, and understand more about yoga's depth, or breadth, and diversity you know, as it developed and changed and adapted over some 2,000 years. So wait, I have to put the pictures up. It's quite key. So I'm an Indian art historian, and I work at the Freer and Sackler galleries, which together constitute the National Museums of Asian Art in Washington, DC. And I'm working on this project, which is, it's, it's huge, sort of a blockbuster exhibition that brings together about 140 artworks made over 2,000 years, mostly from India, except now scattered all over the world. And it's the first time, it's the first exhibition about what we can learn from the sculptures and paintings and architecture that was made about yoga in India. And it's also the first time that scholars are really looking at, ooh, is there something new we can learn from these sculptures or these sites or these paintings about yoga? And what we found is that many of these works, often made by professional artists, that were made over these two millennia confirm things that we already think or we already know about yoga. And actually, quite often, they tell us about histories or yogic identities that have become totally obscured, just hidden or repressed, um, often fascinating, sometimes profound, kind of quixotic and quirky sometimes, maybe troubling as well. But it, we're, putting, we're trying to put back the sort of richness um, that was part of yoga traditions in India and its movement into transnational arenas. I wanted to tell you how I um, started on this project. It's quite unusual. It's like a new field, a new discipline, the visual culture of yoga. And I have to go all the way back to when I was 14 years old. And I went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City and saw a painting, a, a color field painting by someone named Mark Rothko, very abstract and red and cloudy. And I looked at it, and something clicked or changed in me, and I looked around the rest of the gallery, and I felt this, oh, I'm connected to everything. And it was, it was really powerful, it was totally joyous, it was blissful, and it, it endured after I left the galleries. And I went home, and I could still do it, I could make myself feel this great connection. And after three days, I was afraid to tell my parents, because I thought there was something maybe schizophrenic happening, I wasn't sure. And so after three days, I repressed it. I said, that's it, you know, I don't want to do this, I don't want to be crazy. We didn't have any language in the culture I grew up for, for powerful experiences, whether they came from art or, you know, a sense of the Brahman. And um, I felt it again when I was in art school at Parsons School of Design, usually when I was doing life drawing for a couple of hours. And then when I was in my 20s, all of a sudden I started to go to India. Who knows why? Um, and, and, and encountered a culture in, you know, and Advaita Vedanta philosophy um, in which it was actually a goal to sort of understand your connection to a greater, a greater being, an absolute. And um, eventually when I was 30, I stopped focusing on contemporary art and went back to graduate school to study Sanskrit and art history at Columbia. And in my very first Sanskrit class, someone asked our professor if we would be learning about philosophy and religion, and he said, no, this is a class in grammar. He goes, and besides, I can tell you everything you need to know in one sentence. Tak tuam asi, you are that. You are everything, you are one. So I was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this PhD. 
And because um, I, I didn't understand, I thought it was a three year program. So, somewhere into year six of the program, I mean, much to my parents' dismay, um, somewhere in year six of the program, I got this grant. And um, I got a grant to go to India and look for a dissertation topic. And while I was poking around India and studying with a miniature painter, I kind of stumbled into this palace and talked them into letting me look in their storeroom. And their storeroom was filled with paintings. This is one of them. 500 paintings that were each about four feet across. And some of them looked really abstract, like this painting, um, and gold, painted with real gold, and shimmery, and, and reminded me of the color field paintings of Mark Rothko and, and these other minimal artists that had been my first love. And I thought, this could be a dissertation topic. And came back to the States and uh, with drawings of these, because they wouldn't let me photograph them, and trying to look them up. And yeah, I w there were no books about these paintings. Um, the few little mentions I could find said that they were not good paintings. They were made in a decadent period when artists were absolutely uncreative. And the only little clue I had was that those little fellows there were known as nath yogis, which is N-A-T-H. So it's a, it's a hatha yoga sort of lineage in Sampradaya. The only information I could find about them, much to my horror, was a 1934 publication called Obscure Religious Cults of India. <laughs> so, I mean, that was really scary if you're going to try and write a book. And um, in putting together this project, this dissertation, and thinking about this, you know, I learned a lot about the history of Hatha Yoga and about the emergence of this sampradaya, this tradition, uh, the Nats, and also about the king who patronized all these paintings at the very turn of the 19th century, and how and why he became a devotee of a, of a Nath yogi, actually a Nath Siddha, a perfected being, someone who had practiced yoga um, so well um, that he became sort of an immortal ascetic greater than a Hindu deity. And I was able to write the dissertation and understand paintings like this that depicted and represented concepts that had never before entered the realm of South Asian art. So for example, this is from the first page of a giant manuscript, and it represents the Brahman, the absolute, and as a solid gold field, and it's shimmery and luminous, it has no qualities, no color, no form, no time, no end. Um, and its first manifestations, according to the Nats, um, as, as an immortal yogi, um, totally luminous, and then its gradual evolution into more form, you know, more gross forms, such as here as light, then come Hindu gods, then come people like us. And the process of Hatha Yoga, as articulated by the Nats, was that through the practice of yoga, actually through asanas, pranayama, understanding the subtle body, you go on the reverse trip. You go from your gross back to the subtle until you can reunite with the, the praman. Okay. And I guess of those 500 paintings um, that have to do with this tradition that were in Jodhpur, three of them were vertical. This is one of them, and you can recognize what this image is. It's the subtle body, the yogic body, with the chakras aligned on it, um, on the body of a, of a nath yogi, a practitioner. So when I was looking at these and studying them, I, I'm just telling you how this project developed. I thought, well, you know, I should look in South Asian art and, and find other images like this. And it was the old days, so um, when I found another image in a book, I would Xerox it and I threw it into a box. So I finished the dissertation in 2000, and I had this really big box of pictures. And I did, we did an exhibition called Garden and Cosmos, um, to which some of you came, that was about these Jodhpur paintings in 2008. And it was, it was really exciting for me, because the people in my field, the art historians, had said these paintings are horrible. Um, and the people who came to the exhibition 
loved the paintings and thought they were really moving and profound. And now my field thinks they're wonderful, too. So that was good. <laughs> I mean, now we understood that there could be creativity in the late colonial period, um, and we know a lot more about the Nas. So as soon as that project was over, I got together with a group of scholars and scholar practitioners, I mean, really from every field of South Asian studies, so from religion and anthropology, sociology, Islamic studies, um, and we started to think about making an exhibition that looked at the entire sort of visual history of yoga, what new things we could learn. And that's what culminates in, in this exhibition that opens in 2013. So I thought it might be nice to get um, just a sense of what we're trying to do with the exhibition, what we're trying to bring you, and what we think its opportunities are. So this is just to invite you to come to one of its iterations uh, as it travels around the country in 2013 and 14. Come to DC to the opening, we hope. Um, and in each, each time we show it, though, we'll have about 135 artworks that range from the second century to 1940, that go from sculptures and reliefs through two-dimensional paintings, um, I'm moving through time with my hands, to prints and photographs and films. And I think when you walk through the galleries, you'll also have a sense of moving from gross to subtle, from stone to film, that there'll be this dematerialization, there will be experiential moving through it. And we've organized the exhibition into, into these gallery sections here. And the sections came to us, or came to me, because they're determined by what we could find, what survives and what stories were told, or what moments artists or patrons or practitioners decided that things were so important and so noteworthy that they should be translated into enduring materials. So we have a little bit on the origins of yoga as we understand it, like a very pivotal and exciting moment around the fifth century BCE, when men and women all of a sudden realize that their own bodies and minds have the potential to correctly perceive reality. And they can work on their bodies and minds, they can change their relationship to the world by understanding true reality, and they can stop suffering. So these are the roots of yoga in this urge to transcend suffering. The largest section of the exhibition actually is called Path of Yoga, and these are the practices that entered the, the realm of representation. So not everything that we do or know about, but many things. And I thought I'd kind of focus on that because we're all practitioners, and maybe you can find something that will inspire you for the upcoming year or the rest of the day. Okay. I hope that these look, I mean, these are extraordinary artworks, and they're, they're made by great artists, and I know that it's a little bit bright in here. So try and feel the beauty and power. This painting actually is made in Jaipur in the 19th century, but what it represents is a very, very ancient notion of the yogic body and yogic potential. It depicts Krishna, the Hindu deity Krishna, Vishnu, uh, from a moment in the Bhagavad Gita, which is a sacred Hindu treatise, when he reveals to his devotee that his body is co-equal with the universe and all beings and all time. And those of you who know the Gita would know that this is the moment when Krishna is called Vishwarup, you know, the universe form. But I had studied the Gita and translated this in Sanskrit class. What I didn't realize until I started to go back to this project is it's in this chapter that Krishna is called Yogeshvara, the master of yoga. And he gives Arjuna, his devotee, the strength to see this vision. He gives him the wisdom of a yogi. Because otherwise it would just be too powerful and too frightening to see this. So we're looking at notions of the body, notions of power and transformation that are in Indian and Hindu culture, um, but also where, where in time this intersects with conceptions of yoga. So the Gita becomes a very important moment 
for um, understanding the transformative potential of yoga. And images like this, we have several, um, in which artists really grappled with how do you show something that only, a, only an advanced yogi can see? Um, how do you show time, something beyond time, beyond form, within the whole body of the, within the, within the individual body of the yogi? Is one of, aesthetically, I think, one of the exciting aspects of the exhibition. There are also in the exhibition um, a good number of representations of enlightened beings, which means those who started as humans and through kind of their practice and meditation and austerities became immortal perfected ones, like the genies of the Jain religious tradition. And this sculpture, which was made around, um, was made around the year 1000 in Western India, is just a perfect example of how a sculptor could turn the sort of notion of stillness and alertness, you know, simultaneous. You all know this from sitting in Padmasana, how you are stilling the mind, but also staying like very alive. So this sculptor, I think, really got it. Um, utterly symmetrical, because in Jain meditation traditions, you have to be symmetrical and very still in order to clean off the cosmic schmutz they call karmas that keep you from enlightenment. Um, and white is a symbol of sort of a luminous soul. So we have this white, utterly symmetrical uh, body made of generalized forms. Because again, this meditative consciousness and space we're all going to is shared. So there's no reason to have you know, my specific physiognomy, but otherwise perfect forms instead, like his egg-shaped head or his lotus eyes. Um, and it's just great. It's a great artist. You have to come and see it. Um, and I think it will move you to, you know, to sort of feel that kind of stillness and alertness. Janes themselves, who look at sculptures, at images, icons like this, understood that they were models to emulate and would usually sit in Padmasana or stand in a kind of Tadasana for 48 minutes every day. But I will try and make my talk exactly 48 minutes <laughs> for that reason. And here's another, another work. This is also Jane. This is a Siddha, advanced practitioner who's not quite immortal. Um, and what the artist was trying to convey was that the goal of this practice is, is this union with the absolute, is this disembodiment. There are three of these that we know of that were made in history, and this is one of them. So on the outside, it's a humble little shrine made of bronze in the 14th century, and it looks like many other little shrines. But it's what's on the back plate that's so extraordinary. The artist cut out the shape of the Siddha's body so that his body, his Self, his being, is negative space. It's everything. And you have to come and see it in space when it's lit to see that it's that the nothingness that is, is the content. So I'm really very grateful um, I'm, to be able to spend as much time as I do with this extraordinary work. I mean, conceptually, it's quite brilliant, and it anticipates many Western artists of the late 20th century. Also, an extraordinary number of paintings um, that tell us about concepts of meditation and also the power of the goddess. This is a detail. This is the meditator, the sage Chayavana. And here are the two. And this painting, which was made in the Punjab hills in the Himalayan foothills, represents a, a dharana, a mantra, that describes the goddess, and it was made for a tantrika, someone who believed that through ritual, meditation, and the recitation of mantras, that he or she, though probably he, um, that he could call the goddess's presence. So the painting is an instantiation of the goddess's mantra. The one who used it called the goddess into being, and we as viewers can sort of see that, because we have the image on the on the recto. And it's, it's extraordinary. And the artist who made it 
um, not only painted the Bhadrakali's body in gold, but made the jewelry that she's wearing, the emerald jewelry, from the little wings of beetles. So when you look at it and you move your head like this, she flickers and she seems quite alive. I mean, you will be convinced when you see her. Looking at the visual record also enabled me to deal with sort of issues about yoga and power and women. And here's one of the places where I began to find a lot of objects that, that didn't correspond to what we knew in the textual record. This is where things started to get wild for me. Um, this sculpture was made in around the year 1000 in northern India, and it represents a yogini or a goddess. And she's fierce and she's powerful and beautifully sculpted. And if you're close, you can see that she's putting her fingers in her mouth. She's probably whistling or making a war cry. And the sculptor delineated all her little teeth. And this is the sculpture. It's about four feet high. It's made of sandstone. And it lives now in San Antonio. And it represents a type of goddess, a yogini, um, probably one who could fly, which we can see because she's sitting on an owl. That's her vehicle. And quite audacious. I mean, she's not only got her mouth open within the context of Indian iconography for women, hair, loose hair, open mouths, legs akimbo, and weapons, things like that all mean danger, danger, danger. So she has, she has some power there. She's also holding weapons. And the way that the sculptor made that sandstone seem so soft, and he contrasted you know, these areas of just like fleshy softness with these little details of her fingernails and her teeth, really gives it this extraordinary power. It's really one of the greatest Indian sculptures in the United States. Is there anyone from San Antonio here? OK, I just shout out to this museum for being so kind to give us their great treasure so it, she could go on tour for a year. So what we found when we go, we'll go back in the record is that in the 7th, 8th, 9th century, if you go to Hindu and Buddhist tantras, yoginis are mortal women. They're either the consorts of male-initiated tantricas, and they do transgressive things at night and exchange body fluids, but the tantric texts also tell us that through certain practices like these, that these mortal women can become goddesses. Now, that's seventh, eighth, ninth century. Then, by the 10th century, all over India, there are these temples. And each of the temples have 64 or 82 or 108 goddesses. And they're, this is a yantra um, that lists the different names of these goddesses. So we know that there have been these sort of, we know there have been these groups of fierce, hungry demigoddesses. And we know that tantric initiated adepts at night in rituals have been calling them down. And they've been calling them down because the yoginis can give them supernatural powers like the ability to fly, or see very long distances, or travel, or become immortal. Nice things like that that make you want to join a group maybe do something different than the regular orthodox practice. But then, when these temples get built, and they get built all over India, in a new shape, no other temples like this, they're all totally round, they've got niches all around the edge, they're just like those yantras, but turned into stone. So see, each of these would have a little goddess. They look like and that's the kind of temple that the San Antonio yogini came from. She's the only one left from hers. Now, there's another yogini temple in Tamil Nadu, near Kanchipuram, so not so far from Chennai or Madras. And from that temple, there are some 17 fragments that are left. And each of those yoginis, if she stood up, <coughs> sorry. Each, if she stood up, would be taller than me. So it's a pretty big, major temple. We don't know when it was destroyed, but all of the yogini temples went out of worship by the 13th century. Here's one of the goddesses. You can see she's got some 
auspicious, benevolent qualities, because she has a perfect body, sort of a gentle smile, and she's holding uh, harvesting tools. So those are good things. She can protect you. And then she has some other things that make her, that tell us about her power and her potential. One is hair loose. You see that, the hair behind her? Really, she's scary. Um, her earrings, one is an alligator and the other is a snake. Tough, tough woman. And then the uh, cup that she's holding is a skull cup. Skull cups in India mean you are either drinking liquor or blood. So this is a tough cookie. There's a lot of power there. <laughs> and here you have 300 years. Kings are building these temples. Tantrics and regular people are coming to them for various reasons. Kings especially because the yoginis help them guard, uh, guard their kingdoms. And then it disappears. And if we only knew textual history, we would say that was it. Yoginis are gone forever. But then we find them in all these other places. Oh, forgot to tell you. In the exhibition, we bring together three of these yoginis who have been dispersed you know, to different places in the world. And they'll be in our gallery on Tantra in a semi-circular space, kind of dark, a little bit scary, very dramatic. Um, and these are the three. So I think it will be quite, I don't know. We have to see how it will turn out, but I'm really excited. So what I said was that anything I had read in text um, by scholars or Sanskrit texts about these, yoginis told me they were over by the 13th century, but then we keep finding them showing up. For example, they show up in court paintings, often court paintings from Islamic kings in India. So this one is dated around 1600. She's yogini, blue skin, covered with ashes, top knot like a yogini or Amanda, nice hair. Um, and, and kings had kings, even if they were Muslim or Hindu or Jain, uh, they patronized, they propitiated these goddesses to help them win military victories. So we see a sort of a shift in their identity and where they're being worshipped and this sort of transformation in the, their identity. And here's another yogini. Uh, this is a 20th century yogini named Karinga. She says she's a yogini. Um, she performs in the United States, in England and France, with these posters that say, you know, the only female yogi in the world, la femme fakir, because fakir and yogi mean the same thing in that period. Um, she has the iconography of these 10th century yoginis, um, and what she does is these death-defying things, like she wrestles alligators. You really have to press this with intention in your heart, or it doesn't move. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. It's okay, I'll do it. I got it. So here you can see that there seems to be some kind of visual connection between Karinga, the 20th century magician, and this 10th century Tamil Nadu goddess. And Karinga's uh, publicity, she's got some kind of agents working for her, I mean, she's really popular, uh, tells us that she, as a little girl, was orphaned in Rajasthan and raised by yogis who taught her supernatural skills. But in fact, we find out that her name is Rene Bernard, and she was born in France, and what she was doing was capitalizing on this the exotic East and the allure, you know, of yogis who supposedly had supernatural powers. So in putting her in the exhibition, I'm not saying that she was a yogi and that this is, pra you know, practice to follow, but what I am saying is that um, it's very important to understand how yoga made meaning and changed over, over time, um, how especially how in the, when it went transnational, when it came to the West, how there were these sort of sincere moves to teach things, but also this space of exoticization um, that yogis went into, because today we're all trying to understand, you know, what is authentic, what is not authentic, what will help my practice, and we need to understand 
I think. It's very useful to understand how yoga went west. Figures like uh, Karinga had a huge impact in India because it's against this sort of notion of like faker fakirs, I call them, that modern yoga emerges. I mean, there is a real attempt to sort of clean up the record. So she's useful that way. But I also put her in here today because I'm telling you how the project developed. And when I looked at the ways that yoginis changed over time, I realized we are never going to find one true, authentic, unchanged, emerge from Patanjali's mouth, you know, kind of yoga, that in fact, countless generations of teachers, you know, practiced yoga, passed things on to their students, and they adapted and innovated for their time, um, and in terms of what they understood. So it's really, it's like a banyan tree or a river, um, many traditions, and, and those often are the sources of what we do today. So in that light, uh, I'll tell you also that in the exhibition, a paradigmatic, um, paradigmatic object are 10 folios from the very first ever treatise of yoga asanas. I mean, we look at the whole history of asanas, which move from probably only two at the time of Patanjali, you know, to 84,000, you know, and the time of today, and, and why it is that the first time they get illustrated is in 1600 in a text written in Persian by a Sufi for the sake of teaching Sufis. I mean, these are very typical ways that yoga moves across borders, moves from one religion into another, or from a religious into a courtly space. Here's a close-up. This is Nawali, if anybody does that Kriya. And we also look at how yoga circulated in the imagination. I mean, what people thought about yogis and what they did on their downtime. And it turns out that they were um, spies, for example, since at least the second century. They could go anywhere. They could go into women's quarters. They traveled on pilgrimage all the time. They picked up information. Sometimes they did assassinations. They were power brokers. But again, this is part of yoga in culture and history. And the stories are so fabulous. We have to include them. Again, we look at the period. Yogis had so many odd roles in India that were not peaceful and not limited to a very narrow sphere of religion, that they were very troubling to the British when they came and controlled the country, um, particularly in the 19th century. And they not only legislated out what they called bad yogis, you know, underdressed, bong-smoking, armed, revenue-collecting figures that were a threat to the British and their desire for hegemony and taxes. So they not only legislated those out, but at the same time, photographers sent those images all over the world. I mean, for various reasons, people were fascinated by them. And so we have many images like this. We don't know if they're real yogis, if they're posing for the camera, but they're often sent out in the guise of examples of Indian superstition. That so becomes the dominant notion of Hatha Yoga in particular in India, that in the late 19th century, there's a reformation of Hinduism and yoga, and, our, and the Yoga, the Art of Transformation exhibition ends by looking at that period that emergence of modern yoga in India is when the lineaments of what we do today are set. There are many things in modern yoga that come from long ago, but there are certain elements that are so pervasive today that were formed in that moment. So one thing is, for example, that yoga is democratic and open to everybody. You don't have to sign up with one guru and enter a kind of esoteric tradition. Um, one thing is that we learn in classes often, as, as opposed to privately. I mean, you could go to a cave in the Himalayas, and you should, of course. Um, but you can also <laughs> learn in studios here. Uh, another is that we are ways of understanding yoga as a spiritual discipline, not tied to any particular religion, but tied to notions of personal growth. Also, the notion that yoga is is good for modern health, and then it's a form of exercise. Um, develops in early 20th century with figures like Swami Kuvalyananda. 
And then finally, in terms of modern postural yoga, this is a moment when the canon of asanas greatly expands. I mean, we move from fewer postures to many postures. And we move from postures that one sits in for a very, very long time to postures that are linked in flowing sequences. I know that everybody's done at least one flowing sequence today. <laughs> um, so we end the exhibition there so that people will have a sense of, ooh, how we can link our practice to what happened in the past. Okay, so now I'm back at the museum and we're working with the designers and the registrars and the editors and the authors to put everything together and finish the layout and build the galleries. And we're also involved in the first crowdfunding uh, campaign, major crowdfunding campaign that the Smithsonian has done. We kind of need to raise money to finish making this happen and particularly to keep the catalog subsidized and affordable and to have programs. I really believe that programs are very important for this exhibition. People will come and they will have profound experiences in the galleries. I really believe that this is true. And Abhinava Gupta, the great 10th century Kashmiri Shaiva philosopher, um, wrote that aesthetic experience, the good aesthetic experience, is akin to the bliss of enlightenment. So you know if you see a great painting, or you go to a great play that you kind of forget, like all your troubles and that your back hurts and that you forgot to put more money in the meter for your car, because you're just, you're out of time. And Abhinava Gupta noticed this in the 10th century. Well, okay, not the part about the parking meter. But Abhinava Gupta noticed this in the 10th century and he said, this is the space where people can have a flavor of this great bliss. Um, so we will have that, but we also want to have things like yoga classes. And, it's, and yoga classes for children um, to, to make this happen. And I know it's a big surprise, but the federal government um, covers the cost of our building and all the unsexy stuff like plumbing and, and guards and curatorial salaries, but nothing towards exhibitions. So it was the idea of one of the yoga teacher groups that I was with to open it up to the yoga community. And that's why we have this campaign and we would like you to tell all your friends about it and then come um, and enjoy all the programs. And I wanted just to tell you about these dates. Okay, so the exhibition is opening on October 19th. It'll be in DC for 15 weeks. It is a great opportunity to see great art that's scattered now in 27 collections, really all around the world. And then it will go to San Francisco and then to Cleveland. Uh, it opens with a gala, which for us is like a benefit, you know, to raise money for the exhibition. And I mention it here because I'm really excited that we're going to honor people who have had a big impact um, on, on yoga. And they range from Artists like Mira Nair, the filmmaker, whose films are, are deeply influenced by her practice of yoga, to people like Sean Korn and, and Off the Mat, who are showing us ways to you know, take what we've learned and, and use it to you know, make a better world. Also, Tim Ryan, who's speaking tomorrow, is a gala honoree. And um, after that, I just want to inv invite you to um, join us, send us your thoughts or your friends, um, and here's our hashtag, or URL. Anyway, thank you very much. 